wealth transfer is the movement of resources from one power base to another. A good name is better than money. Proverbs tells us that a good name is better than money. 20% of all the hotels in America are owned by Indian Asians who 10 to 15 years ago were living in India, flew to the United States with $100 in their pocket in an economy class ticket. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for a wonderful conference so far. And now we, we, we've received so much information, we're praying that we would begin to see the manifestation of what we've received in terms of information. Give us the ability and the want to and the drive to make things happen in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Everybody say wealth transfer. Say that again. A wealth transfer is the movement of resources from one power base to another. A wealth transfer is the movement of resources from one power base to another. Now, they are wealth transfers that move to firstly an individual, secondly a family, and thirdly as broad as a nation. Uh, you can have from family between nation and family, you can have a tribe, uh, or you can have um, a community or a region. Uh, we just use the word nation to keep it broad. But uh, when these particular wealth transfers begin to take place, as you will see, uh, you will begin to see the need uh, for us be being ready for the wealth transfer. And, and for many years now, uh, I would say for as many as 10, maybe even 15 years, we've heard the wealth of the wicked is being transferred. Who's heard that? Who's heard at least that? That the wealth of the wicked. And, uh, you know, we, we've seen sprinklings of it. Um, but the major reason we don't see major wealth moving is because, like Dr. Mensah Audible mentioned yesterday, uh, systems, we're going to talk about that in a few minutes. But anytime you have a wild transfer that's about to move from one power base to another, we have to gear ourselves in particular for that wild transfer. Everybody say wild transfer. Say that again. Say that one more time. And so we're going to talk for a few minutes here on the subject generational planning. Everyone say generational planning. One of the greatest messages or teachings that you can have uh, in your life is somebody that can give you the steps for generational planning. And so we're going to look at basically levels of revenue. And we've done this in a church, but we uh, want to just uh, reiterate and, and revisit uh, revenue. There are seven levels of revenue. <clears throat> I got a cassette a CD from... Uh, a bishop friend of mine that uh, is teaching this lesson word for word. And uh, he told me he's made a lot of money on the series and he's going to send me a, a check. So uh, I don't know if I should get a lawyer. Do you think I should? Anyway, uh, I've got the seat in my car. I'm listening to what he's saying and even some of my jokes he's using, which is quite interesting. <clears throat> Seven levels of revenue say that. Now, each of these are developed into uh, different uh, avenues. The first level of revenue is wisdom, and there are seven principles of wisdom. Wisdom. There are seven principles of wisdom. I would encourage you to read chapter number eight and nine of the book of Proverbs, <clears throat> because here you're going to see some of the things that wisdom can do. Wisdom is better than money. Wisdom is better than gold. Wisdom is better than fine jewelry. Wisdom is better than fine raiment. James, in James chapter number one, said, if any man lack wisdom, who lacks wisdom here? I'll be the first to say, I lack wisdom. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of 
God that gives to all men liberally and abradeth not. But you have to ask for it. You have to ask for wisdom. Just tell somebody, ask for wisdom. Say that again. The Bible says wisdom will be justified of her children. In other words, if, if you haven't produced any children, not physical, we're talking about the products of wisdom, then you really don't have wisdom because wisdom will produce generationally. Second level of revenue is vision. Vision, Habakkuk chapter number two. Without a vision, the people perish. That's 29 verse 18 of the book of Proverbs. Habakkuk 2 says, write the vision and make it plain. Everyone say vision. vision. Say that again. Vision. It's important that we have a vision, long-term vision, short-term vision, mid-term vision. See, it's important that we have long-term vision. Uh, number three, information, information, information or knowledge. Hosea said in 4.6 or 6.4 of Hosea, my people perish for lack of knowledge or information. Say information. information. Say that again. Information. A good name is number four, a good name. A good name is better than money. Proverbs tells us that a good name is better than money. Say a good name. Say that again. Number five, relationships. Relationships. There are three dimensions of a relationship. There are three dimensions of a relationship. Allegiance, alliance, and covenant. There are seven cuts of a covenant. Not all covenants are equal. Neither do you get the same benefits from every covenant. They are all different. <clears throat> so when you're dealing with levels of relationship, from allegiance and alliance to covenants, you need to understand basically how some of these work. A lot of the time, uh, in, in alliance, uh, the dimensions of an alliance come with a handshake, an expensive dinner, a handshake, an expensive dinner, and an agreement. In these levels of alliances, there are many things that can be achieved, and you may not even have exchanged money just by a handshake, an expensive dinner, and an agreement. All of these things actually have revenue transfers. And then, of course, number six is property. If you have any money right now, a good place for you to put your money would be in property in Harare. Because things are about to shift so quickly, I'm telling you. Shift so quickly. When most of these embassies start coming back and uh, airline companies start coming back, you know, British Airways, KLM, Iberian, and Qantas, and uh, Lufthansa, Air France, when these boy boys start coming back because this nation's going to be a, a hub, it's going to be a transportation hub, it's going to be a commodities hub, it's going to be a, a, a broker hub, it's going to be. If you're sitting on a piece of property, it's crazy, you know, I was watching the news. In fact, uh, Matthew Ashimaloa was telling us, Dr. Audible and I in Ghana last week, he said that Nigeria, in parts of Lagos, they, where, where things are going crazy in the world in terms of real estate, the most expensive property now, land, is in Lagos, Nigeria. In Lagos, and then CNN, did something on that this week. And they were telling us that a piece of land, just a piece of land, half an acre in Lagos, where people are really living on each other, half an acre in Lagos is going for like two million US dollars for half an acre. And people are coming up and building up houses the size of this conference center. That's gonna happen in Harare. That's not prophetic. <clears throat> That's not even prophetic. You know, I don't even need to prophesy that. That's just looking at the way things go. The way things are, is, that's just going to happen. And if you have land within, uh, you know, inside of Harari Drive, my goodness, you set. All right. And then, uh, of course, property. There are many, many dimensions of property. And then lastly, money. Money. There are seven streams of money. I list seven streams, which we may talk about. Everyone say generational planning. So the seven levels of revenue are wisdom, vision, information, a good name, relationships, property, and money. 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 We need all of those. We need all of those. Say, give me wisdom. Give me a vision. I need information. Give me good relationships. I'm building a good name. I'm finding some property. And finally, I need some money. Amen. Uh, Pastor Chich and I discussed the last few weeks, we, we found, she found with some folks, they found some land somewhere in Zimbabwe. 
And uh, for members of our office, the offering, we, we, we're going to be financing that land program for them because we feel it's important that at least members of our church and our staff have a piece of land. It doesn't matter where it is. Amen. As long as we have a piece of land, that's a good place to start. Amen. All right. Okay. Now, when we're dealing with, with rev levels of revenue, we have to deal with capacity building. Everyone say capacity. I'm going to list this. I've done this before, but I have to go to this neighborhood. I'm going to list Tiger Wood, uh, Halle Berry, Tiger Wood, Steven Spielberg, and Bill Gates. Because here, these individuals, respectively, have their respective earnings that are laid out as they pertain to their earnings per minute, what they make every minute, how much money they make a minute. Halle Berry is said to make now almost $22 a minute. It used to be 18, it's now $22 a minute. That, put Halle, that puts Halle Berry's earnings per year close onto, there go the coins, that puts Halle's early earnings close onto uh, $21 million a year based on her earnings of $22 a minute. And that's because Halley is wonderfully and fearfully made <laughs> in the Lord. She makes that money because of what she is. Tiger Woods, the first time I did this research, Tiger Woods was making $175 a minute. Tiger's now making $295 a minute. $295 a minute, which puts his earnings now at $111, $111 million a year. $111 million a year. That's besides his endorsements. Steven Spielberg now is making close on to $750 a minute. $750 a minute. That's putting his earnings close on to $800 million a year. Bill Gates earns $7,000 a minute. That puts his earnings, that puts his earnings at $9 billion a year. Uh, so your value per minute is important. African people have so much empty space in their minute. So we have to increase the value of our minute. We're going to show you how to do some of that. Amen. Your value per minute is important. This is going to be based on the power of the decisions you make. You choose uh, to be successful. You choose to be blessed. You choose to be progressive, you choose not to be. Uh, I'm going to give you an idea of being progressive. I can't walk across the floor and see a paper on the floor and not pick it up. No matter where I am, it just drives me crazy. It just drives me up the wall. Standing in somebody's office, if the pictures are crooked, I just, you know, I don't listen to what they say because I just want to go straighten out that picture. I'm not like Monk, you know. Uh, I was walking in now, coming into the green room, and in the overflow room, some of the chairs were crooked. I said, no, straighten out those chairs. It's a choice, and then it becomes a habit. A choice becomes a habit. Say that. Say it like you had some porridge this morning. A choice becomes a habit. Once you make that choice, it then becomes a habit. Keeping a clean house, once a habit is developed, it then becomes a culture. A choice, a habit, a culture. Say that. I am so horrified, I was sharing with the folks in the green room, I'm really horrified as to the number of people, well men, I can't say people because I've not been in a lady's toilet, but I'm horrified at the number of men that I see after they use the toilet don't wash their hands. I'm standing like in the airport and I just see guys doing what they do. Mathematically you can either do one or two. And whichever one they're doing, I've seen guys not wash their hands. And they walk out there and go shake somebody else's hand. This is bad habits, terrible culture. Just point at somebody, say, wash your hands. <laughs> the power of a decision. The power of a decision. Say that. Say that again. It's a choice whether you're going to take, open a packet of biscuits and throw the paper on the floor in the street. It's a choice. Amen. I won't do it. I will not do it. 20% of all the hotels in America are owned by Indian Asians who 10 to 15 years ago were living in India, flew to the United States with $100 in their pocket in an economy class ticket, went to America, sleeping on the floor, living with Punjab and Gujarati and everybody else 
eating roti and dal out of the same thing. But today, they own hotels. There are three basic things about every wealth transfer that comes. Three basic things. The first one is there's a transfer of gifted people. Say gifted people. Say that again. As we're planning generationally, there's going to be a transfer of gifted people into your life. They will be transferred into your life. Anytime you are going to be promoted, anytime you are going to go to another level, Usually the first thing that comes is gifted people. They're coming with brains. They're coming with ability. They're coming with skills. They're coming with maturity. They're coming with an attitude to serve. They're coming with great experience. They're coming as gifted people. Luke chapter number 8 is so key. The Bible lists several women that served Jesus' ministry out of their substance. These were power women. Because when you read Luke chapter number 9, Jesus is going to anoint 12 apostles. Luke chapter 10, he's going to anoint 70 disciples. He's going to send them out two by two. So Jesus' staff, staff is going to increase. He's going to multiply his group. <clears throat> Anywhere Jesus went, he had a minimum of 100 people. So he needed people that had resource around him. So before his ministry went to the next level, read Luke 8, verse 1, 2, and 3. You'll find that they were power women that came to support his ministry. They didn't come because they could cook. They came with money. The Bible says they were women of substance. They didn't come and cook and get their eyes full of smoke and their hair smelling of, of uh, mapani wood smoke. They weren't carrying matrimbis. These were power women that came with their substance. They came with serious money. So the first thing that God does when you make a power decision is going to bring some gifted people around you. And gifted people are going to contribute on various levels. Gifted people are not always going to come with money. They may, but they're not always going to come with money. They'll come with a single idea. Cheech and I were in Chicago in January. And uh, uh, don't get offended with me if I don't say Pastor Chichi. It's just so much energy. Amen. You know, for you, she's Pastor Chichi. For me, she's Chichi. Chichi and I were in Chicago in January. We were preaching for Bishop Horace Smith, the presiding bishop for the Pentecostal Assemblies of the World. And uh, we, where were we that week, the, the Sunday before? We were with Bishop Long the Sunday before. And so we went to be with Horace Smith, and uh, it was great. One of the other speakers there, well, he wasn't a speaker, he was coming to do some work there, was Dr. Chand. And um, so uh, the Thursday, Dr. Chand was working with Bishop Smith, you know, as a ministry consultant and so on. And then uh, he knew that we were going to be there, so he left a message uh, if we could have dinner. He said, please ask the bishop for permission to have dinner. I said, Sam Chan wants my permission to have dinner? And so, Cheech and I went downstairs and we had dinner with Dr. Chan. And, uh, you know, we, we talked for about three minutes on the weather because Dr. Chan's not talking about something that he can't change, you know. So, after we talked about the weather and so on, he then got straight to the point. And in one hour, he gave us stuff he was charging somebody $40,000 for. See, if he had given me $40,000, that would have been finished by now. But what he's given me is lasting because some of the things Dr. Chan gave me when, when I go to the States next month, uh, there's some things that we're going to be doing based on what he has given us as a strategy. Long term. So the first thing that comes in a wealth transfer is power people. Power people. That's what you have to pray for. Gifted people. Say, send me. Send me. Power people. Power. Say that again. Send me. Power. The second thing is that you remember with power people is that you might be a power person that's going to be sent to someone. You might be a power person that's being transferred to someone. And when you are transferred to that person in a spiritual transaction, if you are being transferred to someone as a power person, for example, uh, if you are coming to be transferred, for example, to Chichi and I, if you're going to serve Tudor and Chichi, what we give you spiritually, what we open doors for you, 
is going to empower you to become even more empowered. But as a power person, you are now coming to associate and attach yourself to something powerful. The third thing that comes, second thing that comes in a wealth transfer is property or land or assets. Power people first, then assets and land. Anytime there's an opportunity for land, it means that you're about to be promoted. I've discovered some things about land and property. Is that sometimes God will offer you a property or make a property available to you that's way out of reach. It's so expensive, it's way out of reach. None of your relatives have all that, that kind of money. None of your associations have that kind of money to pay for that property. But I learned something about property. You know, years ago, uh, the Park Lane Hotel, Samora and Enterprise, had come up for sale. And we knew we had to have that place. We just knew it. I went there, I walked through it, walked through the rooms. You know, I even used the toilet in one of those things and washed my hands, I must add. <laughs> walked through the rooms, went into the houses at the back and already had plans for the place. You know, on the side there was a restaurant there they used to call uh, uh, Kaya Nyama. I don't know if anybody remembers that, amen. Took Chichi there for a few steaks sometime, amen. Yeah, baby, remember those steaks? Kaya Nyama. And uh, I just knew we had to buy that place. But the price was way up there. I mean, it was way out there. Our house that we owned in Hillside was about 100,000 Zimbabwe dollars back then. But they were asking $17 million dollars for the park lane. And I just knew we had to have it. But one of the things that I learned from that property coming available and us having the desire for it was that God increased my faith capacity. That property, even though I didn't get it, it enlarged me. So anytime a property starts coming available, it's to enlarge you. Watch this. That's mountain, that mountain is my mountain, Caleb said. But it took him 40 years to be enlarged. Abraham, I'm giving you this land, but he didn't get it until years and years later because he had to be enlarged. If he was going from a property owner in Ur, living in one house, to getting a whole country, it was going to take a time for him to be enlarged. A time for him to be enlarged. And anybody like King Saul, who is not enlarged in his spirit when it comes to property or land, will never receive a legitimate wealth transfer. Say after me, show me the property. Say it again. Say, show me the land. Enlarge me. Say that again. Enlarge me. Say that one more time. My sister Bernie is over here uh, in Houston a number of years ago. Bernie went to stay with the family by the name of uh, Tommy Wilson. What is his name? Tita? Tommy and Tita Wilson. And uh, I went there for a, a couple of weeks and uh, this is the story Tommy Wilson told me. It's a fascinating story. He used to be a, a soldier in, the, <clears throat> in Vietnam. And uh, Tommy started selling drugs in Vietnam to the soldiers. And uh, he said just before he left Vietnam to go back to the United States, uh, he, he, got, he got hooked on drugs himself. But he said when he left, he had these uh, sausage bags. He just threw his clothes out and those sausage bags, several of them, full of money. Just hundred dollar bills, just full of money. Came to Houston, high on drugs with all this money. And then he said, um, he was walking, you know, down the streets of Houston, just high on drugs, and uh, he asked the Lord to help him. And the Lord told him to take that money and just leave it in a church. He was so high, he doesn't even know to this day what church he left that money. Yeah, Lord. Yeah, Lord. There must be a Tommy somewhere in Harare, amen. <laughs> he says he walked into this church and just dropped that money there. Well, he said, but there was another, there was a young girl that had come from the country, you know, that was also kind of messed up and they kind of got together and eventually married this girl. He said, but the Lord delivered him and started going to a church. He went back to school to learn how to be an electrician. And the second thing he learned... <clears throat> He was driving trains, you know, a train driver. And he was wiring houses and driving trains at night. Wiring out, putting electricity wires in houses. And he worked for this Jewish lady. Somebody say property. Say that again. Say favor in property. He was wiring houses for this Jewish lady and she eventually said to him, I like you, Tommy. Say somebody likes me. Say that again. 
20% of all the hotels in America are owned by Indian Asians who 10 to 15 years ago were living in India, flew to the United States with $100 in their pocket in an economy class ticket, went to America, sleeping on the floor, living with Punjab and Gujarati and everybody else, eating roti and dal out of the same thing. But today, they own hotels. Let's talk about your time frames between now and conference or between now and January. Start framing. We've done this before with strategic life plan. Start revising, looking over your life plan. Start looking over your life plan. You're never too old. You're really never too old. We're just starting out again. I was having lunch with Dr. Roberts. <clears throat> we're preaching for Bill Winston and they were doing the economic conference and uh, the president, or is it the chancellor of Harvard University was a guest speaker, was sitting there. The uh, guy that wrote the book, The Millionaire Next Door, he was sitting there. The real estate owner, Dr. Roberts, he was sitting there. Bill Winston was sitting there. I was sitting there. All of us around the table are multimillionaires. I am too. In fact, I was the only billionaire around the table. <clears throat> so they asked me, they asked me, because it's an economic summit, and they had a senator there from Washington, D.C. So they asked me, they said, uh, because by association, I'm preaching there by association, you know, because they all know of each other. I'm the only one that they don't know of. I'm the mysterious Kushite sitting there. So the millionaire next door man says to me, he says to me, have you read my book, The Millionaire Next Door? I said, yes, I've kind of breezed through it. And he said, well, tell me what you do. I said, well, you know, we in ministry there and we've got a number of things happening. You know, and I said, on a weekly basis, we bring in, you know, several million dollars. By the end of the month, we in billions of dollars. He says, billions. <laughs> I said, yeah. He said, I said, I'm going to borrow some of your title because I have to write a book, The Billionaire You're Sitting Next To. So, and then Dr. Roberts began to share how his mother, she had two sons, an African-American brother, his mother had two sons in St. Louis, how his mother used some of this principle, how she began to put money towards a generational fund for the boys to go to school, educated the two boys. Dr. Roberts is one of eight African-Americans that owns hotels in America. They are 55,000 hotels in America. 20% of all the hotels in America are owned by Indian Asians who 10 to 15 years ago were living in India, flew to the United States with $100 in their pocket in an economy class ticket, went to America, sleeping on the floor, living with Punjab and Gujarati and everybody else, eating roti and dal out of the same thing. But today, they own hotels. Chich and I moved into a hotel in, in Memphis one night. It was a holiday inn owned by an Indian guy. And the towels were awful. So I went there and said, your towels are terrible. He said, oh, you want new towel? You want new towel? Why you want new towel? I said, I want new towel because your old towel is like sandpaper scratching my back. <laughs> Abdul, bring new towel. Bring new towel. Well, he's going to wear those towels out making his millions. Amen. Imagine, 15 years, they own 20% of the hotels. We have to do something. You have to do something. You have to do something. When this whole region explodes, there's not going to be enough hotels to accommodate the tourists coming. This credit crunch, this financial crunch around the world is just temporary. It's just giving us a chance to readjust. Amen.